Part 3. The Places Now that we've learned about the people, the next building block of understanding accessibility is about the places we go. Since not everything we want to do, nor everyone we want to see, is at our fingertips, we need to be able to access the locations where these things are or could be. This means delving into where we live, where we work, and where we play, how we build our regions and cities, and how proximity and land use decisions factor into the transport choices that are viable for people. The places is where this happens. Chapter 3. The Transect The transect is a spectrum of contexts used for transport and land use design. At one end of the continuum is the natural agricultural area, and at the other end is the central business district. In between, we find varying urban intensities ranging from rural to suburban to more urban zones. The current popularity of transect-based design, like Figure 3.1, emerged from Andres Duani's work in the Congress for the New Urbanism. However, similar analytical tools were used as early as 1793 with the Prussian naturalist and explorer Alexander von Humboldt. Figure 3.2 depicts his transect-based, vertically magnified look at the tip of South America from the Atlantic to the Pacific Oceans. Other naturalists employed similar concepts such as Ian McHarg in his influential 1963 book, Design with Nature. In many instances, the transect is used in conjunction with form-based zoning codes. However, the big picture idea is that we should base our designs in terms of both buildings and transport on context much more than conventional Euclidean zoning or functional classification. For instance, residential land uses in terms of placement, height, frontage, as well as general character should differ across the rural to urban spectrum. When moving towards the right side of the spectrum, housing is more likely to be attached and oriented to the street with smaller setbacks. Transport design needs to change across this continuum as well. Prioritize walking, biking, and increasingly higher capacity and more frequent transit in the more urban transect zones. However, great design also includes altering the character of a street. One useful example of this concept is US 50 in the Washington, D.C. area. Well beyond the city limits, where the context is rural T2 and suburban T3, US 50 is a limited access highway. As US 50 moves into the T4 general urban zone near Washington, D.C., it transitions into a typical arterial road. Once US 50 moves into the city, it becomes New York Avenue. While still large, US 50 has become a much more urban street with sidewalks, medians, on-street parking, and street trees. The transect neatly maps the idea of residential density, which is higher in the center of the city, and decays with distance from the center. The center of the city, the old historic core, was often developed around the pedestrian. Select neighborhoods might still be. Larger areas can be designed to be traversed by bicycle, as is often done in some northern European cities. Safe, separated bicycle networks can be retrofitted into cities that cannot be dedicated solely to that mode. Cities from the late 19th and early 20th centuries are often lower density than older ones because they were designed as transit cities. The key factor in such cities is the ability to walk to transit. The lowest density areas are built around the automobile and mapped to the suburban built environment. The access that is realized by potential travelers in a part of the transect depends on the mode around which it operates. Context-based thinking needs to be considered with nearly all of our transport and land use decisions and designs. Often our work even needs to be based on what we hope our places will become, as opposed to their current context. Whatever the case, the transect can be a useful tool. 3.1 Residential Density Density is a measure of something per unit area, or volume. When looking at cities, we might be interested in residential density, measured as population per square kilometer, or in the case of traffic, the number of vehicles per lane kilometer. How it is measured in average can affect the result. So when comparing reported densities, it is important to understand how each was measured. Here we illustrate with population density. The density of the United States as a whole averages high density areas like New York City with low density areas like Alaska, as shown in Figure 3.3 and Table 3.1. This density is a straightforward calculation, but not exactly how people perceive the world. People tend to live near other people, so we perceive a higher density than a national average suggests. The concept of person-weighted density has been suggested which instead of summing total population and land area, multiplies the population density in a smaller area by the number of people who are there to experience it, and then sums that across the total area and divides by the total population. This person-weighted density is higher than the unweighted density and closer to the perceived density, but it still raises questions about which areas to sum up. A parcel, a city block, a block and its neighbors, a block group, a census tract. There is an arbitrariness to this. 
but the most important part is internal consistency. Cumulative opportunity accessibility measures, cumulative opportunity accessibility measures address this in a much more systematic way. As shown in figure 3.3, density is inversely proportional to mobility. Areas with high population density tend to have higher traffic density and more congestion. At the same time, high congestion can lead people to value location efficiency and help spark increased residential density. Later, we discuss traffic density. 3.2, urban population densities. Population density declines with distance from the center of a region. An example shown in figure 3.4 for person weighted density from the Minneapolis region with a peak population density of 5,000 persons per kilometer squared at a distance of zero kilometers to a density near 23 at a distance of 50 kilometers. The center of a city is more valuable. By definition, the most valuable place to be near becomes the center. And so, more people want to be there or near there to minimize their transport costs. Rents are higher there, as is population and especially employment density. Land farther out is less expensive, so people can afford more space. This phenomenon has been observed for as long as there have been cities and was quantified by Colin Clark. 3.3 Pedestrian City Rome was famously built on seven hills. These hills were not originally one metroplex, but rather small villages populated by different groups that later melded into a single conurbation. For instance, the population of Alba Longa was settled on the Caelian Hill. Some of the Sabine tribe lived in a small village on the Quirinal Hill in the 7th and 8th centuries BCE, and it was incorporated into Rome in the 6th century during the reign of Servius Tullius. This occurred after the legendary rape or abduction of the Sabine women when men led by Rome's founder Romulus sought brides from the nearby Sabine tribes and were refused by their fathers, leading to a conflict mediated by the wives and daughters. The families of the abducted women may have been those who migrated to the Quirinal. As Rome grew, these villages interacted with each other more and more. One imagines that as population settled the hills, there was some trading taking place, but most people would work locally in this once agricultural society. How populous was ancient Rome? Estimates vary widely. Story estimates a peak population of 450,000. On the higher end, Carcopino cites estimates over 1.2 million, over an area larger than the walled city of figure 3.5, but suggests that is too high. In part, these estimates vary because the area of ancient Rome varied over time, in part because it's not clear what the Roman census was collecting data on, whether it was just adult male citizens or the entire human population. It's also not clear how many Roman citizens were residents of the city of Rome, living within the Aurelian walls. Let's illustrate with some assumptions. One-way travel time budget, E equals 0 0.5 hours. Walking speed, S equals 5 kilometers per hour. Walking network radius, R sub N equals S over B equals 2.5 kilometers. Network circuity, C equals 1.25. Walking Euclidean radius, R sub E equals R sub N divided by C equals 2 kilometers. Walking Euclidean area, potential, a sub e equals pi r sub e squared equals 12.56 kilometers squared. Density, d equals p over a sub e was unknown. Population within travel time budget threshold, p equals d times a sub e equals unknown. This area is a walking city if you start from the center. This is close enough to the 13.7 kilometers squared enclosed by the walls that we can call Rome a pedestrian city. Someone on the central of the seven hills of Rome the Palatinus, could reasonably commute to the walls and back each day. However, it would take about an hour to cover the diameter of the city. So the question turns on the assumed population density. As a point of reference, the 2012 population density of Manhattan is 27,227 kilometers squared, which is enabled by 19th century technologies like elevators and rail transit. Obviously, parts of Manhattan are higher and other parts are lower. Rome currently has a population density of 2,101 per kilometer squared. At the extreme, the infamous Kowloon Walled City in Hong Kong had some 30,000 people on 2.8 hectares, 0 0.028 kilometers squared, in the 1960s, giving a density of over 1 million people per kilometer squared. If we go with Story's low-end population estimate of 450,000, this gives a density of 33,000 persons per kilometer squared, higher than contemporary Manhattan, but in line with the density that immigrants on the Lower East Side experienced when Manhattan's population peaked in 1910 at 39,208 kilometers squared. And of course, it is higher in places where people live 
as there are lots of places where people do other things, work, shop, watch gladiatorial battles, or lounge about and eat peeled grapes. While not impossible, it does imply teeming streets. Estimates of twice that or more seem implausible, but we emphasize that none of us live there and no one has a time machine. And if we had a time machine, doing an accurate census of ancient Rome is not the highest priority. Also, one can have a pedestrian city that exceeds the one-way walking travel time budget, but not a city that one interacts with on a daily basis. This is more the equivalent of adjacent and overlapping cities, which likely had multiple cores, perhaps one per hill. 3.4. Neighborhood Unit The traditional practice of urban design was that the house would show its best side to the street and engage and welcome the visitor and passerby. The rooms inside the building would match this by having the reception rooms facing the street facade and by being recognizable in the fenestration and with suitable detailing of the front. This attitude was maintained throughout the 19th century in spite of the noise of the horses and horse-drawn vehicles and of the hubbub of pedestrian crowds and the cries of the peddlers. With increasing wealth and increasing demonization of the urban environment as dangerous, filthy, and unhealthy, urban middle classes removed themselves to the suburbs, but initially maintained the style and expressiveness of their dwelling, emulating the rural villas of their much richer role models. The generally generous lots gave the space to place the house at a distance to the road and from each other, and to produce a park-like environment in the early and more expensive, low-density, hard-to-serve-by-transit suburbs. The arrival of the car and the much broader urban exodus of the early 20th century changed the equation as streetscapes became less interesting. While many American suburbs maintained a public face through porches and porticos, the reversal of the order began, entry from the back via the garage. Back alleys were now used by the house owners and not as earlier by the servants, coachmen, and delivery boys. In Europe, both apartment blocks and suburban houses began to reorient themselves towards the garden in the back. The new desire for maximum sunlight inviting a flowing transition from the ground floor living room into the garden instead of a first floor reception and dining room with kitchen and pantry on the ground floor together with the servants. In this context of increasing expectation of quiet and sunlight, the New York designers Clarence Stein and Henry Wright went one step further and reversed the order completely. Their 1928 design for parts of Radburn, figure 3.6, opened the house to a common park, which flowed into the garden of the house. The front entry would be from a cul-de-sac accessible garage and parking space. The residents, and in particular the children, could walk away from the cars to their destinations as different parks were linked by suitable underpasses and overpasses to avoid the streets. The original design covered only a small area, but the design idea was applied at much larger scales in many post-war suburbs around the world. At this scale, it became clear that the loss of the streetscape was in many cases not balanced by an active communal use of and life in the parks. Many garden gates were locked. The view into and from the park was blocked by hedges and fences. 3.5 Bicycle City Houghton, Netherlands is built around the bicycle. Building on an old settlement, Houghton was initially planned as a city of 30,000 people. Constructed from the 1960s onward as a reliever for Utrecht, it is connected by a short rail line with two stops in the town. Unlike buses, cars cannot cross the town but can circumnavigate on a ring road, as shown in Figure 3.7. The industrial and commercial sector is in the southwest of the town, with good highway access. Though there is a balance of jobs and workers, most residents work outside the town and most workers commute in, which is not surprising given its rail and highway connection with the rest of the Randstad. The architecture and feel of the place is otherwise very familiar to anyone who has visited a planned U.S., French, or U.K. new town from the same era. Without the single-family homes, most of the buildings are townhouses or apartments. David toured on bike one afternoon during the 2014 World Symposium on Transport and Land Use Research with colleagues and generous officials. These are his observations. First, the center of town is the main train station, which was recently rebuilt. The number of tracks were increased and the station was elevated so it was easier to cross east-west. Under the train station is an enormous bicycle parking facility, the Feats Transferium. There are many bike paths through town. Small humps are used to discourage cars, which are prohibited, and motor scooters and mopeds, which are, as well, but seem common. The best, most vibrant part of town is the old town, indicating there is much planners need to learn about recreating places. There are some shared roads, though most prohibit motors officially. The newest part of town is centered on Castilium, inspired by a Roman town. 
One development is inspired by a Norwegian fjord town. Some colleagues felt the town too sterile, which is the rap given to new towns and especially suburbs everywhere. It is not clear what planning academics are looking for. Hypodermic needles on the street? It is, of course, a suburb of Utrecht, so the core city functions, especially entertainment and culture, will agglomerate there, as cities are where the childless youth seek to find mates. To conduct pop psychology and apply two of the big five personality traits, this is a classic case of a trading off openness to new ideas, which involves exposure to risk in cities, and neuroticism, which is fear-based and wants to minimize risk and seeks more controlled environments, loosely planned communities or suburbs, which at some level is in part correlated with age and parenthood. 3.6. Bicycle Networks The conventional low-hanging fruit approach to building up a city's bike network was to first lay down bike lanes on streets that have the room, and then by filling in the missing connections with shared line markings commonly referred to as sharrows. The problem is that establishing a bicycle accessible city requires more than a network that looks connected on a map. While some bicyclists feel comfortable riding on almost any road, the vast majority of bicyclists simply don't feel like they can ride right next to relatively fast-moving cars. If a certain trip requires riding on such a street, bicycling is no longer a viable option. So in a city comprised of bike lanes or cycle tracks as in figure 3.8, where I feel comfortable riding are connected by sharrows and higher speed streets where I don't feel comfortable riding, I end up confined to a small island of bike friendliness. That might be fine for recreationally riding around a bit, but it makes it difficult to actually get anywhere and limits bicycling as a utilitarian mode. Think about a ski mountain that assigns one of four levels of difficulty to each of their slopes. The green circle for beginners, the blue square for intermediates, the black diamond for advanced, and the double black diamond for experts. Now, if I'm the type of skier that would only ride on beginner and intermediate slopes, and I take the chairlift to the top of the mountain, I need to be able to get down the mountain using only green and blue slopes. If I start down on an intermediate slope and suddenly reach a point where my only options become black diamonds and double black diamonds, I'm in trouble. Thus, ski resorts make a concerted effort to set all their users up for success. The same should go for bicycling in cities. The new wave of separated bike facilities are great and help make our city streets, as the former Parks Commissioner of Bogota, Gil Peñalosa, would say, 8 to 80 places, where both an 8-year-old and an 80-year-old can move safely and enjoyably. More often than not, however, we connect these 8 to 80 bicycling streets with double black diamond streets and intersections. These missing links negatively impact people's choice to bicycle in the first place. How can we do a better job of connecting our bike networks? To begin with, we can link our streets in the array of different bike facilities that are now in the bike planning toolbox with who can actually use them in order to get a better understanding of how the bike network functions. For instance, the bicycle level of traffic stress approach, shown in figure 3.9, classifies streets based upon the bicycle level of traffic stress, LTS, that they exhibit to the user. The methodology uses characteristics such as physical separation, operating space, speed of adjacent traffic and intersection treatments to assign one of four traffic stress levels to street segments and intersections. By connecting the LTS classification scheme with what has become known as the Portland typology, we can better understand bike network problems. The Portland typology categorizes individuals into four basic bicyclist groups, no way, no how, interested but concerned, enthusiastic and confident, and strong slash fearless. If I'm an interested but concerned bicyclist who only feels comfortable riding on cycle tracks, bike lanes, and slow speed streets, asking me to share a lane with fast-moving traffic is like asking an intermediate blue rectangle skier to head down a steepy, icy, mogul-filled run. In the eyes of the rider, the perceived safety risk is the reality. Being forced to ride on streets beyond my comfort zone might just push me back into my car, just as reducing perceived risk increases risk-taking behavior, increasing perceived risk reduces risk-seeking. So if we want 8 to 80 cities, rather than just a handful of 8 to 80 streets, we need to take a network-level approach to bike accessibility and make sure we don't leave ourselves with disconnected islands of low-stress bike facilities. 3.7. Transit City In the United States, regular frequent transit service was once feasible for neighborhoods of single-family homes. It is still feasible where economic conditions are favorable. This section conducts some back-of-the-envelope calculations to illustrate the phenomenon. Consider the one-mile, 1,600-meter gridded landscape that is common in the Midwest and Western United States due to the Northwest Ordinance of 1785. This grid is largely the backbone network of streetcar-era land-use design. 
While there are a variety of ways this grid can be carved up, one common way is to have 10 cross streets per mile of grid in the long direction, 520 feet or 160 meters, and 20 cross streets per mile of grid in the short direction, 260 feet or 80 meters. This arrangement produces about 200 blocks per square mile, 77 per kilometer squared. The size of each 520 by 260 foot block, center line to center line, is 135,200 square feet, 12,560 meters squared. Considering street and alley space, lots typically have a 40 foot frontage with 110 foot depth, 4,400 square feet, about one tenth of an acre or 400 meters squared. This spacing gives 12 houses per block face in the long direction or 24 houses per block. In this configuration, no houses face the short direction. If there were only housing, this would give 4,800 houses per square mile, about 1,875 per kilometer squared, after accounting for roads and alleys. At 2.5 persons per household, typical of the United States, this gives us 12,000 persons per square mile, PPSM, about 4,700 per square kilometer in single-family homes at typical built densities. While some space is devoted to schools, parks, retail, commercial, and industrial activity, among other uses, this should be persuasive that 10,000 persons per square mile is feasible over large areas without Manhattan-like high density. The city of Minneapolis, for instance, according to the 2010 census, has a density of 7,417 persons per square mile, about 2,900 per kilometer squared. At its peak population, it had over 10,000 persons per square mile, or 3,900 per kilometer squared. Transit. The target density for successful transit is often given as 10,000 persons per square mile. If we assume that every person originates many short trips, which can be dealt with by walking or biking, and one long trip per day, say going to work or school or shopping, the 10,000 persons per square mile would generate 10,000 transit trips per square mile. So we have 10,000 boardings per square mile. This is roughly streetcar era demand in cities. If we space transit routes every half mile, as was typical of streetcars, both east-west and north-south, with stops where transit routes crossed and halfway between, the square mile area is served by 21 stops. The four stops at the outer corners are shared with four other areas, and the eight non-corner stops at the perimeter are shared with two other areas, while five stops are internal to the one-mile square. This gives us 12 equivalent dedicated stops for the area. With 10,000 persons per square mile and 12 stops, each stop serves 833 people per day. If transit vehicles carry 50 people each, that is, 17 full transit vehicles per day. Of course, transit vehicles do not generally fill up at one transit stop, and over a 17-hour day, assuming no night service, this would be one transit vehicle every hour. If instead we wanted to service at 10-minute headways, but full vehicles, we would expect each vehicle to fill up one-sixth of its load at each stop, or about eight passengers per stop. This would be a much higher load factor than generally observed. The maximum walking distance to a transit stop would be about 0.35 miles, 560 meters, and the average walking distance would be about 0.175 miles, or 280 meters. Modal comparison. So what guarantees people will make one transit trip per day? If there were no good alternative, as in the peak streetcar era, figure 3.10, this is an easy choice. Today, this depends. The argument for using transit is that in our idealized grid-like city, with a grid transit system, the transit system is as direct as every other mode, so there is no lost distance due to circuity. The only lost time is the schedule delay, which is a maximum on average of five minutes, less if people can time their weight to match the transit vehicle. In the time when the vehicle is stopped, and accelerating and decelerating, boarding and alighting passengers, and the transfer time between vehicles. An idealized grid requires, at most, one transfer. Again, with a headway, the time between vehicles of 10 minutes gives an average transfer weight of 5 minutes, less if the routes are timed well. Finally, with any transit advantages such as signal timing priority, exclusive lane, or stopping in lane as opposed to weaving into and out of stops, transit can recover some of the time lost vis-a-vis -vis the automobile. Where transit is better, faster, cheaper than the alternative, and frequent enough, people will use it in large numbers. This is observed daily in large cities. Thus, it must be possible to obtain faster, cheaper, and frequent enough service levels. In most places in the United States, the transit service and ridership is not there. Let's work through an example. 10 minutes, acceleration, stop, and deceleration. For a five-mile trip, there will be about 20 stops at quarter-mile, 400-meter stop spacing. Each stop results in 30 seconds lost time, 2 to 3 seconds per boarding, plus acceleration and deceleration. That is 10 minutes of time lost there. This will generally result in longer times than an automobile, 
even with stop signs or red lights every quarter mile. 5 minutes, initial schedule delay, assuming random arrivals. 4 minutes, walk access time for the average passenger, walking 0.17 miles. 4 minutes, walk egress time to the final destination, though perhaps lower for downtown workers. 5 minutes, transfer time on average if it is effectively uncoordinated. So now, even with our idealized transit system, we have lost something like 10 plus 5 plus 4 plus 4 plus 5 minutes, or up to 28 minutes longer than the car for a 5-mile, 8-kilometer trip. At a value of time of $15 per hour, 25 cents per minute, this is the equivalent of $7. The transit fare is $2 and the cost of gas at $5 per gallon, $1.25 per liter, and 25 miles per gallon, or 10 kilometers per liter, is $1, not even considering carpooling. Net additional out-of-pocket cost for transit is now the equivalent of $8. Of course, vehicle ownership at $10 to $20 per day can be avoided, as can parking charges. Also, we are not considering externalities. The Express. If demand is high enough, we can make transit go faster and have a higher frequency. This is accomplished by having the vehicle stop less often and or giving it a limited access right-of-way. One disadvantage of express routes is a longer access egress time. Stops can't be spaced as close together if lines are to achieve economies of scale, so stations are on a one-mile instead of one-half-mile, 800-meter spacing at best. If that access and or egress is by transit itself, that imposes additional scheduling time penalties. We can compensate because now our land use changes take advantage of the express services. At express stations, densities rise. Apartments replace single-family homes. Express buses and commuter trains often have low frequencies, while modern or modernized subways may have one train every two minutes or better. So if we increase the highest distance to a station for one mile, 1600 meter, spacing between stations and one mile between routes, so every station is a transfer, but increase the frequency to one transit vehicle every two minutes, we get the following. Two and a half minutes acceleration stop and deceleration. For a five mile trip, there will be about five stops at one mile stop spacing. One minute initial schedule delay, assuming random arrivals. Seven minutes walk access time for the average passenger. The walk access time is twice that of the local transit above, or 0 0.35 miles, 560 meters. At three miles per hour, five kilometers per hour, this is a walk time of 7.1 minutes on each end though changes to land use patterns could reduce this. Seven minutes, walk egress time, though again, changes to land use patterns may change this. And one minute, transfer time, on average, even if it is effectively uncoordinated. For a five mile trip with transfer, we now only lose about 18.5 minutes. This is less than the local transit service above and can be reduced if more people live closer to the station rather than spread out uniformly across the landscape. To reduce transport costs with transit-like services, we can arrange cities linearly, thereby eliminating transfers and reducing access costs. This wastes potential accessibility for non-transit modes. Optimal urban form depends on the technology being optimized. In a city where driving is perceived to cost a dollar per trip, and cars save between 18 to 28 minutes per trip compared with transit, it is no wonder the automobile is the dominant mode for long-distance trips, even in historically transit-advantageous places. Reducing automobile dominance requires changing the perceived and real cost of driving for drivers, as there is little that can be done on the transit supply side that will make a significant difference in the absence of that for most markets. In dense areas, the market takes care of the cost structure by providing expensive parking. In low-density areas, there is enough room for everyone's car without charging. Systematically rearranging existing cities for transit, or any mode, is putting the cart before the horse. Transport should serve activities, and while transport and land use co-evolve, that co-evolution is slow over decades and should be adaptable to alternatives. 3.8. Walk Shed The walk shed, or the distance people are expected to walk, shapes how we design transport systems. In the United States, the rule of thumb is often that people will walk only five minutes to get to a transit stop. In fact, this is too short. A five-minute walk does not even get you from one end of a large shopping mall to the other, and many people make a full circuit on two floors inside the mall on foot. If there are nice enough environments, planners should expect most people to be able to walk 10 or 20 minutes comfortably with no problem. Shopping mall developers do, and they are far more mercenary than the public sector. Rosedale Mall, pictured in figure 3.11, has a transit center at the edge of the mall around which a conceptual walk shed is drawn. Notably, some buses stop at more than one mall entrance, as shown in figure 3.12. A longer assumed walk shed has many design advantages. It allows transit providers to increase spacing between stops, which increases running speed, which makes transit more attractive for those already on board. 
transit systems trade off running time for access egress time, higher access egress time for lower running time when stops are spaced farther apart. In dense urban areas, transit stops are generally less than five minutes away by foot, so it is unclear what people would do. The average pedestrian trip to a rail station was 0.47 miles, nearly 800 meters. A longer distance, 10 minutes, is useful and slightly better predictor for the residence end of trips. The shorter distances, 5 minutes at the work end, makes for a slightly better predictor. In short, people will walk longer to transit than we typically give them credit for if they have decent walkable urban routes, high quality and frequent services, and environments that lead people to underestimate the actual time involved because their minds are not focused on how awful the walk is, but about how interesting their surroundings are. 3.9. Automobile City The car shapes and reshapes urban form, demanding more road space per person than earlier technologies. Road networks and land uses designed for an earlier technological era were not optimal for the car. The automobile enabled distances to be traversed faster. This meant people could live farther away from their destinations on larger plots of land and still satisfy a travel time budget. How much? In the transit city, we saw 1,875 houses per kilometer squared. In the 20th century subdivision of the automobile city, this reduces to about half, roughly 1,000 per kilometer squared, houses on quarter-acre lots in residential areas. The new road networks also differed. Lower density requires more length of road to serve the same number of people. Imagine if it were served by a grid. While the density of the street network, length of network per unit area, might be the same, or even drop, and the traffic on the network might be the same, the extent of the network needs to be twice as long if the density is half as much. There are other possible architectures that would have fewer roads and lots that were the same width but on average twice as deep, but in practice we got lots that were the same depth and twice as wide, having the number of houses fronting the street. Notably, alleys were eliminated and garages were placed out front. The fine meshed grid was also abandoned along the way. While the macroscopic grid established by the Northwest Ordinance of Roads every mile typically remains, it is not subdivided into a finer grid, but into a less regular pattern, including more curved roads and cul-de-sacs. This increases network circuity. The situation in Minnesota is typical. Following the transect of the proposed extension of the Green Line to the southwest, as shown in Figure 3.13, we move out from the center city of Minneapolis to 1st, St. Louis Park, 2nd, Hopkins, 3rd, Minnetonka, and 4th Ring, Eden Prairie, suburbs. We see the population density tends to drop with distance from the center, but so does road density in terms of center line and lane kilometers. The net is that persons per road kilometer decreases. Hopkins is actually a bit denser than St. Louis Park, but is also a small town absorbed into the commuting system, illustrating this is not a perfectly smooth process. In Eden Prairie is denser than Minnetonka. In short, there is more pavement per person in outer suburbs than the inner city. Infrastructure is used less intensively. With fewer persons per lane kilometer, we would expect a lower density of traffic. And this is true on most roads. But in the end, there are still bottlenecks. Spacing people out upstream of the bottleneck does not reduce traffic at the bottleneck itself. And with a less redundant network, there are fewer reasonable alternative paths, leading to less reliable road conditions. In addition, lanes for automobiles are wider in newer suburbs. So not only are there more lane kilometers, there are even more square meters of pavement. The automobile explodes the spatial requirements of the city, not just in lowered residential density, but in more space for roads. A greater share of the area in the city is devoted to roads, but the suburbs require more road per person.